at Washington University, we are a large referral center for rectal cancer. We treat a lot of patients probably in the top 5% in the nation as far as volume of rectal cancers that we see. And we partner with the radiation oncologists and the medical oncologists here at Siteman Cancer Center to optimize the treatment of these patients. The diagnosis of a rectal cancer isn't a death sentence, and it doesn't automatically mean that you're going to need a colostomy bag. There's a difference between colon cancer and rectal cancer. The colon's about three feet long, and the last six inches of the colon is actually the rectum. The rectum then becomes the anus, and then it's the outside world. When a patient comes into my office already diagnosed with rectal cancer, there are several things that we need to do. First, what we need to do is obtain a detailed history and physical. We want to know if they're having symptoms or if they're completely asymptomatic. The vast majority of people do not have any symptoms or do not have any family history. However, there are several symptoms that can be attributed to colon cancer or rectal cancer, such as bleeding, change in bowel habits, either constipation or diarrhea, weight loss, pelvic pain, abdominal pain. The other thing that we need to do is complete staging of the cancer, determining where it's spread and how advanced it is. Treatments can range anywhere from chemotherapy and radiation all the way to surgery and sometimes non-operative treatments depending on the circumstances. We recommend that the average population gets a screening colonoscopy at the age of 50. Um, African Americans are actually recommended to have screening colonoscopy at the age of 45 and somebody with a family history will have screening colonoscopies even earlier than that. Overall, younger patients are encompassing a greater portion of everyone who's being diagnosed with colon or rectal cancer. And nobody wants the diagnosis of cancer, but I don't think it's something to fear. I think it's something that we can treat, and more frequently than not, we can cure it. What really sets Washington University, Siteman Cancer Center, and BJC apart is the way that both myself and my other colleagues who treat colorectal cancer in medical oncology really integrate our practice with our colorectal surgery colleagues as well as our GI radiation oncology colleagues. We work together to create a custom plan for the patient for their particular quality of life goals, their health status, as well as characteristics of the tumor. We have been big here at Siteman about writing protocols that reduce the overall treatment time and customize the number of treatments per patient. There are many patients who don't need surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation anymore. They might just need two of the three. There are other patients who still might need all three, but we've led the country in using a short amount of radiation, just five days versus five and a half weeks. This potentially de-escalated and upfront therapy may actually have equal or fairly equal risk of recurrence compared to those who undergo the current much longer route of chemotherapy and radiation. After a patient has received their neoadjuvant therapy, whether it be radiation therapy or, or chemotherapy, I will see the patient back in my office to discuss the finer details of surgery. Broadly speaking, there's two main operations that we do for rectal cancer. One of them is called an APR, or an abdominal perineal resection. The other is called an LAR, or a low anterior resection. These are two very different procedures. APR is one that actually involves removing the entire rectum and the anus. So in that circumstance, there's no way for us to be able to reconstruct the patient or put the patient back together again, in which case under that circumstance they would have to have a permanent colostomy back. On the other hand though is the low anterior resection and that's when we're actually removing the rectum and all the lymph nodes and other tissues around it, but we're actually able to reconnect the patient, put them back together again. There are risks associated with any of these operations. The most common risks associated are infection, bleeding, and ureters can be damaged during a procedure like this. Additionally, the nerves that control sexual function also run down in the pelvis and they can be damaged during a procedure like this. Anytime you take out a piece of intestine and you hook it back together, it's just like plumbing. It can leak. That's why we do this temporary ileostomy bag that the stool goes out in that. It allows that anastomosis or that join up to heal in. About three months after the initial operation, we do this second operation where we close that ileostomy. When you remove part of the rectum, your plumbing is never gonna be the same, and the way that you have bowel movements is never gonna be the same. Early on, it's more pronounced, and over time, things will continue to improve. One of the benefits of coming here is that we're able to help facilitate the likelihood that a patient would be able to get reconnected, meaning we look for every opportunity to try to put someone together to do a low anterior resection, as opposed to doing an abdominoperineal resection. When it comes to radiation oncology, there's actually not a doctor in Missouri or Illinois who's seen more rectal cancer patients than our team here.
And we have a very good team of radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, and surgeons that treat these patients. We're very comfortable treating rectal cancer here. We have been very actively involved in clinical trials and research projects in order to best tailor and refine the, the treatment so that patients get the appropriate treatment and are not over-treated or under-treated. When you have a team that does this day in and day out, there's just not many surprises, and that benefits the patients. We can have very good outcomes. This is not a death sentence. We can get you through this treatment, and we can hopefully cure this.